welcome to uh, the third webinar in our webinar series, Survival of the Fittest. And what you just heard was Survival of the Fittest of Mob D. Um, we're very happy uh, that uh, many people are uh, tuning into this uh, webinar, which will be on digital cash benefits. We um, have done one webinar already uh, covering um, digital cash. We talked about the digital cash platform. And for those who didn't join that one, uh, this will give you a chance to um, I'll give it a little bit of a recap of that. But the focus today is on digital cash benefits. Um, we'll start with a presentation, sort of 10, maybe 10, 20 minutes. Um, yeah, uh, something like that. Um, we will have a 10 to 20 minutes of panel discussions where we invite you to uh, ask uh, questions. And we will end with um, a co-creation session where if you have ideas for how we can make uh, things even better uh, in the area of digital cash, we very much welcome your, your ideas on that. Um, with me for uh, these, um, these things, uh, I have a uh, panel. And uh, if I start with uh, all the way from uh, Gurgaon, India, I have with me uh, head of India of Crunchfish, Vijay Raghunathan. <coughs> Hi. Hi, Vijay. Good morning. Good we also afternoon. have uh, from uh, Stockholm, uh, our uh, chief product officer. Uh, it's uh, Magnus Lagerson. How are hey you guys. today, Magnus? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. Are we ready to uh, to go? What do you say, Vijay and Magnus? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Ready All to right. go. All right. So <laughs> let me let me go back to the presentation again. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So uh, digital cash benefits is all about what what does digital cash bring to the world and uh, to whom is it of benefit? Um, that is sort of what we will talk about. We are very bullish about digital cash. What we think we have brought to market is, uh, you know, it's not a shy statement uh, saying it's sort of the future of payments and um, I, I had this sort of slide, uh, sort of a last slide uh, when we talked about digital cash platform. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll bring you a little bit closer to why I think this is the future of payments. The agenda of today, I, I actually thought of starting a bit odd, uh, talking a little bit about crypto payments, just as a backdrop really for today's uh, talk. I'll do a little bit of a recap of what we talked about two weeks ago uh, on digital cash platform. And, and by the way, Everything is recorded. Uh, so uh, uh, on crunchfish.com slash webinars, you find all the uh, previous uh, webinars as well. So you can certainly go back if you're interested to, uh, to see that presentation we did sort of two weeks ago. So it's there. But I'll do a recap here so everybody can come to the same level. And then uh, I'll, I'll go into more in detail at the end with digital cash benefits, which is the main topic of uh, today. So talking about crypto, uh, it's sort of an interesting thing that has come up. Uh, it was during the financial crisis 2008 that uh, Nakamoto uh, in Japan, he sort of cracked it how to do this. And he came up with, uh, you know, this idea with Bitcoin. And since then, you, you, I'm sure you've been following. Uh, it's every time they hit the new record or uh, the whole uh, value of Bitcoin maybe goes down a lot, um, then it, it hits the news. But uh, Bitcoin is, is sort of here to stay. And it's a uh, it, it's sort of a way to pay completely without any sort of uh, intermediaries. You don't need banks. You don't need uh, central banks. They don't really regulate it. And um, it, it's, it's become a bit co controversial. I think central banks don't really like it. I know China has completely banned it. Uh, and it's banned also in other eight, I think, uh, other eight countries. Many, many of the Middle East countries have banned it, actually. Uh, and that's because it's, it, this could be a way to sort of finance maybe terrorism uh using crypto but but it's it's here uh many many countries um uh, many central banks are considering at least regulating how the crypto will will go to market but then in, in, in the second largest economy in china it's, it's actually banned you can't do it they're going to come up with their own digital yuan as you know and they're going to showcase that at uh, the olympics so uh they, they they're making their own sort of head uh, runs into this but Bitcoin is, is, um, is, was the first one. That's the original one. Uh, but there has been many other 
alternative coins that has come up since then. Um, and, and the reason is that Bitcoin uh, has some, some issues. Um, it, 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 it can be used to make transactions, but um, it is uh, extremely slow. Uh, as, as a, it, it won't really be a transactional sort of payment uh, mechanism because I, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, globally with all these uh, computers that are, um, are sort of with uh, some sort of consensus um, agreeing that this is a legit transactions. Um, all that power, with all that computing power, the number of transactions that it's possible to do per second worldwide in Bitcoin is seven. Seven transactions a second. And that's, you know, that says it all really, that uh, that doesn't really uh, scale that well if you only can do seven transactions per second. Um, so, this is a bit of a problem. And, and what you can do then if you have such a, uh, you know, scalability problem as Bitcoin is sort of showing is that you could, you can look for ideas on how can we make transactions then faster? How can we speed it up? And, and what you do then is that you add layer one and layer two overlays onto the underlying payment service. Layer one, a layer one solution is still using the underlying blockchain that Bitcoin is built on. It's still, it's still an overlay on that, but it adds things to Bitcoin. And, and, and I think a, a, an example would here be that you could, you could add maybe a scheme that you are, um, you're not maybe, you, you may be not going for um, a complete, proof of work, as it's called, uh, but you are doing it in, uh, in shards. That is what altcoin like e Ether has introduced that, that you do instead uh, a proof of stake instead, uh, mechanism instead of a pr proof of uh, work. That's a, but you're still basically interacting with the underlying uh, blockchain approach. You're not really going outside of that. That's a layer one solution. A layer two is that you, you take out money from the blockchain and you, with a proprietary security protocol outside, to do transactions. And then you commit it back again. So you take out money, Bitcoins, and then you do things with it and you put it back. And a good example in, in Bitcoin, which is quite well known, is the Lightning Network. That's a layer two solution where you are bringing out uh, transaction. So you, you can transact faster. Uh, so a layer two solution to Bitcoin helps. And the reason why I give you a little bit of this background is that digital cash, digital cash platform is that kind of a solution to any payment rail. We are both actually a layer one and we're also a layer two solution to any sort of payment service of the world, including crypto, um, provided that you are having the crypto uh, held uh, with custodian banks, really. So you, 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 you hold it, not just on your mobile phone, but you, you actually are yeah, putting crypto on a, in, a, in, in really in a, in a bank. And, and many banks are coming with that. And that's, I guess, all these countries where they want to regulate uh, what's happening with crypto. I, I guess they will provide us kind of facility. But so digital cash platform has that ability. If you, if you think that the top level here, the core banking system, this is where you have your account. You, you are an account holder in the core banking system, your transactional account. This is where you, you transact from. You pay from that and you can receive maybe your salary into your transactional account. That's part of the core banking system. It's regulated and it's, uh, it's sort of, uh, yeah, that's, that's the status quo of the systems today. What we add is, is sort of two layers to this. We have something we call digital cash online, which is a layer one solution. We, we're not changing any security protocols whatsoever. And we believe that if we take this from a banking perspective, this digital cash online is, a, is sort of an, an account which is running on a separate server, an overlay server to the bank with all the accounts of their customers, or it could also run in the cloud. Uh, it's, it's becoming more and more popular that uh, core banking is sort of moving to the cloud. And, and then this account structure could run in the cloud. What we want it to be is that we want it to be separate from the core banking system. At the lower level, we also have digital cash offline. Then we, we are 
working with what, what Crunchbase did for the entire 2021, we, we, we cracked of how we actually could maintain a balance uh, in a secure way on a mobile phone. Um, the money actually still sits at the core banking system, but we have reserved out money. So we have that available uh, to pay offline. So the way digital cash works, it's sort of like a one, two, three. We reserve money. The money's still there in, in the core banking system. We, we reserve money, that's step one. Then we pay as one step. And that is basically, you can look at that as a, we clear the payments. So the payee could be assured by the service that you will be paid. That's step two. And then step three is settlement. And that is when you are affecting or, or you are hitting the core banking system by moving money from the core banking system to you know another, another bank. But digital cash is about one, two, three. It's reserve money. And you can do that to an online digital cash online, or you can take it all the way down to digital cash offline. Then you pay and then you settle one, two, three. So this is sort of like the architecture of our digital cash platform that we went through two weeks ago. At the top here, the core banking system, digital cash online, which you can access from, you know, it could be a mobile phone or this could be a smartwatch, or you can see that at home, um, accessing it from the web, really. Then we can reserve down money and, and we have created a secure environment, uh, software-based, software-based secure environment on the mobile phone where we can sort of that maintain that balance. And here we have cryptographic keys, private keys, which is used to be able to sign off transactions. This is the bridge between the level of digital cash online and the lowest level, which is digital cash on non-mobile devices. And that's sort of like a, ch a smart chip. And there could also be uh, a SIM overlay in a feature phone as well. And, and, and we can have an interaction between the mobile phone and uh, these uh, smart chips and the feature phones in a complete offline mode, which is kind of a, a unique thing. We have a patent pending on that, which I think is, is important for any market where internet uh, connectivity is, is sort of scarce. So here you see a little bit how, it's a little bit what I've been talking about, that uh, we, we are moving sort of balances here. At the top, you have the core banking system with your account balance, and you can reserve out uh, money to uh, the digital cash online balance. This activity could actually be completely hidden from the user or any payment service. It could just be an activity happening at the bank in order for them to provide uh, themselves with better robustness and stability and load, load balancing. It, it doesn't have to really be visible to any user, uh, any customer or any payment service. They could just sort of do this on their own. From the digital cash online level, uh, you could take out pieces here that you, the user would reserve down to one or many apps. Uh, and I'm trying to show that here, that so you, I'm taking that mon money down to app one and app two. Now we have split that digital cash online balance into bits and pieces, really. You still have a bit of shared balance that could be used by any payment rail or any app uh, when you're online, but we have reserved out uh, money for app one and then separate money for app two, which these apps could use in a complete offline mode. But we, we can also make an, an exchange or a, a payment, if you want, uh, between the uh, digital cash offline on a mobile and these digital cash non-mobile devices. Uh, this could be on a, on a smart chip, but it could be on a uh, uh, in a feature phone, we, we can have an interaction there. And, and this could even happen in a complete offline mode. So this is the, ar the architecture for digital cash balances. So why is this a good idea? What, what does this bring? Well, let's go into the main topic of today, digital cash benefits. What, what is it really? So again, trying to relate back to why I wanted to talk about that crypto needs desperately, Bitcoin needs faster transaction speeds. And, and digital cash in a similar way, like the Lightning Network is a layer two overlay on Bitcoin. What you see here at the bottom here, that the digital cash offline, either on a mobile phone or non-mobile devices, this is a layer two overlay on, um, on the underlying sort of payment service. But we also have a layer one, uh, which is the, in the middle part here, digital cash online running in the back end. It could be on a server on the cloud. 
we, we are not really changing any, we're not adding any uh, extra security. We, we are just uh, adding that extra level of uh, yeah, robustness to it. But that's what we do with digital cash online. And what we do with digital cash, we add features, features that these payment services actually need in order to become a better product. And, and this is important for the payment service itself, but certainly for the banks who are the uh, issuer, who, who provide those services to their customer base. It's very, very useful that these features are, uh, you know, th these payment services that the banks are offering here is as good as possible. And it doesn't have to just be the banks. You know, a payment service could be coming out of a, a mobile operator. Uh, they, they, and, and, and we can add, to that as well, and it could come out of the central bank. You know, we're talking about central bank digital currency. So we can add good features that the central bank digital currency need in order to, uh, yeah, replicate cash that they actually are re replacing. So taking a little bit of one step back, and then I'll go into benefits here. I, I, look at the payment rails that sort of exist today. Um, I, I've, I've divided into my favorite sort of, uh, uh, presentation form of a Boston matrix, two by two matrix. On one axis, I have online and offline, that's sort of uh, in the vertical. And then on the other axis, I have legacy and new. And an, an online payment system, um, which is the legacy, that this is cards. Uh, it's been around for 50 years and it's, uh, you know, we still use it a lot. Sweden, where I live, uh, I think. 85 or something like that, 80% of our transactions uh, in store is, is sort of car payments here in Sweden. Uh, cash is almost going away. Uh, we have less than 10% of our uh, of transaction is cash. Uh, and and what is also the, what's coming strong in Sweden is instant payment. We have one, one service that most people here in Sweden are using, it's called Swish, and, and that is becoming more and more popular. And that's sort of the new online service. Crypto is not really much here, but but uh, I want to put that as an um, I put it as an offline new thing, and and the reason it's it's certainly an online transaction, but it's it's something you technically then would hold just on your mobile phone as a, a sort of a cryptograph that represent your value. But when you want to transact and do things, you you need to go online. But it, it is just like cash, something you can hold, you know, yourself. Uh, so. That's a little bit describing sort of what's the payment rails uh, of today. And what I want to walk you through now then is how can digital cash provide desirable features to these various schemes? And let's start with crypto as we sort of started with that one before. So if I turn that card, I, I go for digital cash benefits for crypto. Certainly we can also, just like crypto, the whole crypto industry are looking at uh, adding faster transactions. Yes, check on that. We, we certainly can add faster transactions uh, to crypto schemes. We will, uh, yeah, we're all about that. Uh, this could be in an online fashion, but it can also certainly be in, in an offline fashion as well. Offline is interesting because crypto transaction wise is completely always online. You know, um, the way crypto works is that it needs to be online because the only thing you trust there is the actual blockchain itself. So there, there is a blockchain that uh, needs to be validated that um, you know you, you have trust. All computers, if you, we talk about Bitcoin here, have that same representation and they ha all have to agree on that uh, this is a legit payment. So it's very much an online activity. But it, it is interesting to add maybe here offline payment capability with crypto. And we can do that with digital cash offline. The Lightning Network, which was also a, a layer two, um, as I talked about, even if it's a layer two, it's still an online activity. It's online payments. But we, with digital cash, we have something new here to crypto. We can give them offline payment capability. Uh, so you don't have, a, have to have any connectivity and still sort of pay with crypto. Instant payment verification, that's sort of certainly that the PE would feel that, well, I immediately I, I can trust that I, I've been paid here. And, and we can, another interesting thing is that we can add service interoperability. So with digital cash, uh, you, you could pay with one then digital currency like Bitcoin, and, and that could be having a, a service interoperability with another scheme. I think that's pretty unique what we can do with digital cash as well. So th this is what, what we bring here. If I move up to 
the top part, uh, talking about online payment schemes, which it could be cards, could be instant. And I, I look for what are our benefits for online payment rails. Um, that, that is that what we could do, and we can facilitate online payment without the back end, without the core banking system. And, and that's huge because the core banking system are in, if you think of the banks of the world, uh, they, these core banking system has been around for, yeah, I don't know, since the 70s or 80s. So they're, they're quite old systems very often. And they were not really designed to take on the, the transaction load, which is now happening when uh, really things much more is sort of going digital. So if, if we could facilitate payments without actually having to touch the uh, back end at the moment of payment, we will touch it later when we do settlement, but that, that could happen sort of, you know, in a later stage. You remember we had little caches about reserve, pay, settle in three different steps. So the settlement part, when we hit the uh, core banking system could be much more happening at, at, the, at the time when it's convenient. And that provides that load balancing. Load balancing is extremely important for banks. So they, they, not, they, they, they basically don't time out because they are just overwhelmed by all the, uh, the transaction load. In, an interesting thing we do here, shared digital cash online across mobile apps and payment rails. There is actually an activity in India right now to introduce a new, they're calling it UPI Lite. Uh, that, that's the instant payment scheme in India, UPI Lite or UPI 3.0. Um, this will be a, a, a way to um, sort of isolate away the core banking system. And they need that because it's just exploding in India. They are, they're soon doing 5 billion transactions on UPI every month, which is just, yeah, unheard of. But the UPI Lite 3.0 is, they, they have actually distributed out balances to per app on, on your phone. Uh, and this is a very good feature that we have instead, that we have a shared balance. You really don't want to piecemeal it up to many, many apps, because then you, you have small, small pockets of, of, uh, of uh, digital cash on many apps, where what you really would like to have is what I'm offering here, is a shared uh, balance for all uh, apps. And, and that's gonna be very, very useful, uh, because then um, you, you just have, you, you can just access that digital cash online account from all the apps, really. So if you are online, it's no point in actually splitting it up. It's better to have a shared. And, and I think that's a big advantage to the new feature that is uh, coming out on UPI. I think Indian banks would, would prefer it, having it this way instead with a shared balance. But we, we also add for any online payment scheme, uh, offline payment without a network. You know, that, that's extremely, I think, interesting to have that. That's what we worked with last year. Um, ease of use and smooth onboarding. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we can have these payment services could run on any sort of form factor, uh, much easier to use than using a smartphone maybe. And we have cool ideas, a little bit of how the cell network works in the US that you, you can just receive a payment. And even if you're not onboarded, we help you then to onboard in a very, very smooth way. Uh, that, that's what I mean with that smooth onboarding. We have a patent pending on that. You can even do cross-currency payments, even if you're offline. Uh, it's a pretty cool uh, feature uh, that I think we can add to, say, instant payment schemes that uh, wanted to do payments. Uh, you know, here in Europe, we have the MSAC um, Association, which is trying to bring instant payment services together. Uh, but we, we can sort of, even if you're offline, uh, we, we can facilitate even then cross-currency payments, which is interesting, as we have many currencies here in Europe. Um, and then, yeah, we basically what we give is this payment stability by uh, offering, uh, say, a, a redundancy here, um, uh, yeah, with, with our, our whole solution. But looking at specifically, all that is common for both cards and uh, an instant. But if I if I look for um, digital cash benefits for instant, for instance, at the top right corner uh, or the bottom uh, right corner here. Instant payment verification, you know, the sheer load for UPI, you know, because they do 5 billion transactions a month, they have a timeout. If the bank can't respond within 20 seconds, the whole transaction will time out. So many times people standing and waiting and waiting and waiting, and it could take 20 seconds. And then it will say denied uh, that the payment can't go through. But it's still a long wait here. Our way here will be a much faster verification that, yes, you will be paid. Similar as the card networks do it with pre-authorization. 
And we can offer all this sort of service interoperability, which, yeah, if we go back to Europe again with EMSA, would, would be an important feature that th th it's easy to interoperate uh, between different sort of payment services. Lo looking at cards, uh, what do we bring there? Well, on any sort of MasterCard or Visa card, we, we can add digital cash as a dual service that runs on cards as well. So you have your Visa, Visa service on your Visa card, but we can have an additional digital cash service running on the same cards. So the card both can be uh, compliant, so you can pay worldwide at all the card terminals, but at the card itself, you can also add a digital cash service. And that helps the cards, the, the card networks or the payment networks um, by, they can go anywhere then. They don't just have to go to merchants who have invested into car terminals because they are quite expensive, these car terminals. Uh, th now they can go to any sort of, you know, if, if the merchant just have a, a smartphone uh, to receive payments, they could then do that verification of this payment that is a digital cash payments. So they can expand their network tremendously by having a sort of access to, uh, th that it can also do a dual service. That, that's a big value for uh, payment networks. Let's look at CBDC. And as you know, in two weeks' time, we will do a little bit of a deep down, uh, deep dive in, into CBDC. CBDC is the topic for the next webinar. Uh, but I, 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 I can't do this, you know, digital cash benefits without talking about what is the benefits for CBDC, central bank digital currency. This is, you know, a topic all over the world. They're, they're all central banks are thinking of that. And, and, and so you can do CBDC in two ways. Either it's the, the central bank itself. Uh, put out an account structure for, for the country, for all their citizens, and then it's sort of a service from them. But what is probably going to happen in most countries is it's going to be a two-tier model, that it's, it's a wholesale from the central bank down to financial institutions like bank or wallets or mobile operators that, that in turn have uh, access to the, 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 the people. So it will be a retail level between the financial institutions and the people and the central banks, they are the banks, they, they remain the bank of the banks really. Uh, and they, they provide uh, and they guarantee this uh, currency uh, in, in, in their country really. And here, I think we excel with digital cash. We provide a tremendous long list of benefits. And I, I was thinking, how can I show this? Uh, and I decided to at least break it up for what are the benefits we do, uh, which are more related to digital cash online, our layer one overlay, and what is related to digital cash offline, which is on the right side. So if we start a little bit on uh, quickly on the left side, because you, 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 you can see some of those things. Well, because we, we provide, uh, the, with Digital Cash Online, we, we provide this facility that payment could happen even if a bank is down. So you, you, you create that better stability, even if um, we can have load balancing at the bank. So this, you, you, you get much better, yeah, uh, resilience or, or stability of the whole thing. Um, still all these things with shared balance, we talked about it, many of the, those things here, smooth onboarding. Uh, we, the, the, at the bottom there, we have form fa factor agnostic. You know, it can run on anything, mobile, you can pay from the web, uh, but you can also have it on uh, sort of easier to use uh, bearer devices like cars or var variables. You know, we, this is for, this is of all sort of, yeah, we're agnostic. You can, it, digital cash can be on anything, which is an, a useful thing. And the nice thing here, if we look at the online service, we, we, did, the, the central bank won't go in here as sort of an, an elephant and Trump just take away sort of the, the payments uh, industry in the market, but they, this will be in combination because digital cash will be the bridge which helps the central bank to allow them uh, the uh, all their financial institution banks and um, you know whoever is the issuer here of payment services to to work but with their currency instead but more importantly because you know the central banks they are today issuing cash you know today we have digital money that's issued by today the uh, commercial banks that that's they are the ones that issue you know, if you have uh, money on your bank account, the central bank don't guarantee that, except if you have a, maybe in Sweden, you have a 1 million krona guarantee that if, if a bank would default, then um, you, you can sort of still claim it from the state, a million. So sort of is the guarantee, but the money is guaranteed by the bank. 
The only the, the money that is guaranteed by the central bank, that's the cash and coins. And, and as you know, cash and coins, they, they have special, that payment rail has special properties, which I believe must be maintained if, if cash is going to go digital. One of the things that, you know, a bank notice, uh, what, what that has is that you can pay offline for sure. You, so CBDC without offline payment, I think is almost pointless in my opinion, because they are taking away cash, certainly here in Sweden, it's going away fast. So unless they have a really good solution for offline payments, it's sort of, well, what's the point? Because we have already commercial payment services. So then they don't add anything. Ease of use, I think is extremely important because they have to cater for the entire population. Some people uh, are, don't have a smartphone. You have very young people or maybe elderly people, or it could be various reasons why you need a simpler uh, form factor. And I think uh, ease of use will be key. I inclusive universal service, that is a very important feature as well, because if, if you come to a country, someone could give you a banknote. You don't have to prepare to receive that banknote. You just receive it. And when you've received it, you can start, you know, you, you have received a value. And that's the inclusiveness of cash. We have um, provided ideas of how that could happen. It's a little bit what I talked about before with the Zelle network in the US, uh, their instant payment service that you can just receive a payment as a message. And then uh, you don't have to have been onboarded before, but you can onboard later in order to start interacting with that. Privacy within limits, probably the most important thing, certainly here in Europe, they've done a survey of the Europeans. What do they, what do you want of the European sort of Euro or sorry, the digital Euro? And um, most people said privacy because you can be private with cash uh, and you need to be able to be private as, uh, again with, um, with CBDC. And then I mean really private. I, I don't mean that the banks shouldn't necessarily see what you do, uh, and certainly not the central bank, because that could be very dangerous uh, the, with sort of uh, the whole state is spying on you. But, but even the banks. So this, this is not just that you're private against that the merchant don't know who you are, but it's, it's also the banks. You can be private. And here you can be private within limits. Because just like you, you know, you can come to the bank with a small amount of cash and you can just deposit that into an account. Similarly, you should be allowed with CBDC that you should have, if, if it's just small amounts. So if you receive, say, a payment here, you set up, a, it could be a Google uh, or a Gmail account, uh, very anonymous, donaldduck at gmail.com, and you receive money there, you, you could actually open a bank account with, I guess, minimal level KYC, minimal level know your customer, that minimal level KYC will not allow you to do whatever you want. You can't send big, big transactions out of that account, but it, it allows you a level of freedom, just like you have with cash. If you want to start paying higher amounts, well, then you have to uh, do a proper KYC with the bank and, and, and tell who you are, just like you do today. If you, you can't deposit money into the bank, but you, then uh you know anonymously but if you come with a whole bag of money uh, you know then uh, they will they, they they are by the regulators obliged to ask you question where did you get it in order to uh, control uh, money laundering and things like that but similarly we had we have to have the equivalent here with with digital uh payments here so these four first ones i think are absolutely key uh if uh banks gonna go digital or central banks gonna go digital with cash really you need offline, you need ease of use, you need uh, the universal aspect of it, and you need privacy. I'm going to talk about that more uh, next, uh, next webinar, so I, I'll leave it at that now. But as you see, the, the list is long here, uh, that what else we can bring here, and, and some, uh, some of the things I've already talked about. So for this reason, I, I'm still convinced that digital cash, the country's digital cash, is the future of payments, because we have something which, regardless of form factor, it could be on mobiles, smartphones, feature phones. You can sit at the web at home and, and pay, and you can use cars or variables, whatever. And for any payment rail, card, instant crypto, CBDC in the future, this is sort of, uh, uh, we add benefits here, which are extremely useful here. And this could be online as well as offline, as you know, because that's our layer one, layer two here. So I, I think we have something which fits as, a, an, as, as an improvement for all the payment service of the world in, in a very, very, very 
neat way actually here, bringing all these features that currently uh, are lacking. Instant is not stable enough because the bank goes down uh, every month, you know, so you need to stabilize it. Crypto is slow, so we can, we can make it faster, even make it sort of offline. CBDC needs all these sort of cash-like features. Well, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Uh, and, and digital cash provides that. And cards, uh, we can add features to their service that they're currently not having today because it's sort of very limited uh, within the uh, EMV network. So that was the presentation part. Let's see what, what time is it? Yeah, I've been talking much longer than I thought. I'm uh, sorry for that, but we'll uh, swap over to more of a uh, session now with my panelists. Uh, let's see here, gallery. Magnus, you, you don't tell me you have already answered all the questions in the chat room, uh, mm. but I know you, you love to just answer before. Uh, I haven't looked at the questions yet, but maybe you could, uh, because I know you're fast, Magnus. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit what's, what's going on in the chat room, because I see I had 16 questions and, I, and we have to be fast in answering them. Yeah, I, I might have answered a few of them already, yes. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, there was a short, uh, just I think people talked a bit about uh, experiences from, from crypto. Uh, and um, yeah, that was, I think, more of sharing between everyone. Uh, then we have got some questions. Um, uh, from Danny, Danny, I think it was a good question. What happens when customers never, when customers never goes online, and how big transaction log can be kept on a uh, in the device? Yeah. Uh, and um, one of the things uh, which is good with our solution is that we will settle if any of the two parties goes online. So it's kind of hard to to hide <laughs> behind anything. And the money is also reserved like at the issuer side. So there is like no need if you not want to go uh, offline uh, online again. Uh, and then you can say, okay, what happens then if I lose my phone or, or whatever there is? Uh, there, there is like a log for everything which happens. So uh, using an ordinary claim process, like if you have a claim with a card or any payment rate, you could actually then get the money back if you can prove what happened with your phone and so on. Uh, so, um, but that's more of an issue process. And then I got a follow-up questions regarding on, yeah, how many transactions can we store? And uh, that depends of course, on which kind of device that you store the, uh, the payments on. But on an ordinary phone, uh, I think, uh, and I need to check this uh, up because I don't remember, but I think we talked about at least a hundred transactions. But in the dialogues we have had with the issuers uh, and the payment system so far, they have talked about 10 to 20 transactions to be allowed uh, uh, offline. And it's important to know that it's the issuer settings, setting these rules for yeah, their own specific payment methods. So we just provide the technology and then there is uh, configurations in the setup to be done by the issuer. Um, yeah, you can. You, it's good, Magnus. Yeah, yes, go on. Uh, if you, I know, I see that you have already answered most of the question, but uh, but it's good if we bring them up uh, live uh, talking because uh, the yeah. chat room might not be available. So if, if there's anything, or you you might have seen something as well, VJ, that you picked up as you wanted to respond to. Yeah, I think that uh, bit on uh, you know either party uh, being any one of the two parties being online uh, for the settlement to anyway happen. I think that that's critical because any case, even if the merchant, even if the consumer is not uh, online or does not want to go online, the merchant will definitely want to go online to collect his money. So uh, I think there's there's that inbuilt uh, you know check and balance here. Uh, and I I think the the key part here is uh, you know how this can be interoperable across multiple payment trails. So I think that's uh, quite an interesting and Quite a unique uh, feature because I think amongst all the you know myriad of uh, payment mechanisms available in the world today, you know there's not much which brings it all together. Uh, you know because they all have different needs in in different. But I think the kind of solution we have can enable a seamless transaction at any point of time, 
uh, irrespective of what happens in the back end and which uh, payment instrument is used i think that's a brilliant that's like cash i mean that's why we call it digital cash right i mean uh, because it, it's going to work always so yeah i just wanted to add that point to, you know, uh, I, th I think it's a, I think it's an important point, Vijay, because I think some of the major banks we talk but talk to in India right now, I think they they are looking for the, the digital cash online, which is uh, it's a uh, they they are they are looking at looking at all or putting all the payment rails, cards, um, buy now, pay later, uh, UPI, uh, that it hits our sort of digital cash online. If there is no right. sufficient balance there, then uh, th then they can uh, basically notify the payee that you know the, the payment is sort of done settlement then they, they could sort of plan for so they they are not on their knees anymore for the sheer pressure that happens uh, at peak demand yes yeah and and to that extent you know because it covers all the major major payment rails for any major bank so uh you know the cards i mean all these major banks cards is a big payment mechanism today so is upi so is wallet so i think they want to cover you know, uh, all of these rails with one solution. And if it's easy to implement, then brilliant. So I think that's what makes our solution very uh, attractive. Uh, I mean, we're getting brilliant responses from all the major banks and wallets. So kind of a testimony to the, the power of the solution, I think. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, Magnus, I, I, I keep you as my scribe, uh, finding good questions to answer. Is there anything else that you want to bring out that... Uh... You know. Yeah, there is an interesting discussion around interests and how that could be calculated. And um, yeah, I, 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 I thank Anders for bringing that up. I think it's interesting to, I mean, again, we provide uh, the technology and uh, you, we have the storage or a log like in the phone, but there is also like um, mirroring towards like a ledger in the back end. So the interest could definitely be calculated there. And then you also brought up this, uh, that it could also be, and that's also what we have presented in some cases where you don't really have to like store the money off offline. It's, it could mo be more like of a credit. So you have a credit stored. So it could be run like a credit facility as well. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's again, more of the setup of the issuer how they would like to do it and and uh, yeah it, 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 is it the case Magnus that we, we you know we we actually it, we, it's, it's not everybody's talking about tokens uh, uh, you know that you, you CBDC is very token oriented you you have you bring tokens down to the phone we, we don't view it that way what we have is that you you use the money actually still sits at the core banking uh, and that could be f facilitated by uh, that you have a a balance, a positive balance on your account, but it could also be created by credit, as you said, Magnus. But we we just have a, as you call it, mirrored. We, we, we get, you have reserved some money, but, but you haven't really moved it down. It's just that the money still sits there at the core banking uh, because it needs to be there for when settlement comes, uh, you know, because the merchant, as Vijay was talking about, th that could settle. You could completely be still offline. So we haven't, we don't move money. So uh, it, uh, any interest calculation and all that uh, is cer certainly just up to the issue how they want to handle it. Uh, they, they could have separate, I guess, interest if they want to, because digital cash online, I think, maybe just be an invisible thing happening at the back end of the bank. But digital cash offline, maybe they will say, well, if you have it available offline, it is just like you go to an ATM and take out cash. So we won't give you uh, interest for that. It could be that way. But again, as you said, Magnus, we, we don't set those rules. That will be of the issue. We, it, you know, we, we, we're not interfering in that way with the banks. We just are providing a technology platform, a digital cash that they could deploy in the way that the central bank or the uh, yeah, the issuer here, the bank, uh, how they want to deploy it. Uh, that's, we don't set those rules at all. Yeah, and we got a follow up. So regarding the mirror account, that's more. So uh, if there is like virtual accounts, yeah, it could be virtual accounts or just ordinary like sub accounts to your existing account, and uh, so on. So uh, there is uh, all kind of possibilities. So if in the environment we have set up now, then it's just accounts, but they could then be linked to uh, your ordinary transaction account, but also like a credit facility. 
Yeah, I, I think that the if you do the virtual accounts sort of thing, the, the important for me would be that you are you want to separate out the uh, digital cash online account from the core banking. So so if the core banking goes down, you know, if there's power fail or something, then you have a, 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 an outside facility that actually could uh, transact uh, even if that happens. This this creates redundancy, and stability, and load balancing uh, at its core, and that that's always the first version. Any, I think, issuer would like to start with digital cash online. They can do that. They don't have to ask anyone. They can just do it themselves to get stability. After that, they can go to the user base and say, well, do you want to be able to pay offline? We can provide that facility, the digital cash offline. And then we, we can look at cards and variables as well as, as a, an additional mechanism as well. We have got a question for you as well, I think, Joachim. You are the best one to answer that one. Is Which there one? a risk here that PayPal copy this? If we disregard your patents by making it service offline, uh, good luck, PayPal. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I we we have a fantastic uh, IP portfolio here. We we actually have seven. Uh, uh, we have one granted patent, which is for really one of the core ideas here of how you can pay uh, offline uh, in an asymmetric way that you you sign up digitally a payment and then you you. Um, you receive something just as like a message that you can verify just having a, a public certificate either you, you can go and find it online if you're online or you have it previously downloaded paypal actually th this idea that we talked about here that both sides settles uh both the payer and the payee um we this is our original patent idea uh, that was that wasn't actually going through in its core because paypal as well as MasterCard, they have that same idea, but they have done it in a proprietary system. They have done it in a system where it's you pay from a secure element to a secure element on the other side, and then you you are in a way securely communicating also uh, in proximity locally. What we have done uh, is we we probably will get the patents, in my opinion, on having the same idea here that both sides can settle, but. We have the additional feature here that uh, the receiver doesn't have to have a, uh, a secure environment. Uh, you just need a certificate in order to receive. And, and, and that creates a lot of flexibility, as I said, for inclusiveness, for privacy and all that. Um, and and I, I, I think that we are, I'm very happy with our IP portfolio here, having seven uh, uh, innovations that are um, we have applied for patents for and, and one even granted them. So I don't think pay, I, I think, Right now, I don't, I, don't, I don't think banks or payment service would like to just do a copycat of what we've done. I think they, it would be so much better for them to just collaborate with us. We, we, and we are happy to collaborate with any, any of the global players, any bank, any payment service. Uh, they can have digital cash as an uh, overlay. That would be a better way than to go into a patent war with us when we have years ahead of them in terms of our filing dates. Anything and I, I think I would. I think I would also say that the uh, the huge other advantage of a solution like ours is that we are, uh, you know, because we are not a, a provider of payment on our own, right? We are agnostic and we are kind of work with all the other players. So uh, to take the solution into multiple banks, multiple wallets, multiple uh, networks, uh, yeah. networks, yeah. Uh, you know, as a technology provider, it's a lot simpler and easier compared to for any other singular payment service provider to take, uh, create a solution like this. Yeah, we, I we, think we, that's we, yeah, we provide something for yeah. everybody, which is uh, sort of, you know, it, it's always hard if you're going to, PayPal is going to do it themselves, they're going to do it for PayPal, for their service. We, we will have an exactly. advantage that we do it for every single one. And that will provide so much more, you know, speed and uh, and also, in a way, profitability doing it that way. So I think we can quite easily protect our um, our, our position here, being uh, with our unique proposition to the market. I know you're looking, Magnus. Have you found any more questions for you or for VJ? <laughs> uh, we we got a uh, um, question regarding on uh, uh, when the sync will be done and how how often. Uh, when you and then I you answered that it it's up to the issuer, but you could set rules for how many transactions you can do offline, the total amount of uh, that you allow uh, offline, maximum tra amount per transaction, for instance, and so on. And if uh, you reach any of the, these rules set, then you have to go on online. But otherwise, in most cases, 
a user would most likely not notice this because you would go online and then you sync and then you are offline. So since most like, cases... And, and it's the same with the, the digital cache online. They, they can decide uh, the time and frequency on uh, how often they would um, settle yeah. those uh, digital cash online transactions as well. In the same same way, they can do it maybe every ten minutes or once in during midnight or whenever they have spare capacity. That, that, that's sort of that they would have rules for that as well. Yeah, but we our APIs and SDKs support those kind of rules and risk limits and so on. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks. It's really interesting. Thanks for a lot of good questions. Um, we. Luckily, the last session uh, in the two previous webinars has been over in a few seconds or minutes at least uh, on co-create. I don't know if you have some of your questions is already providing with, with us with ideas on how to make it better. So we thank you for that. But let's let's go over to then the, a little bit of a co-create. If, if there anyone specifically who, who have been sitting on a question or uh, sitting on an idea that you uh, are happy to share with... Uh, uh, us here in this uh, chat here, uh, happy to take that. Otherwise, uh, we will, uh, I'll just uh, do a quick uh, uh, sort of announcement of what's going to be uh, happening next week and also showing you the, the schedule for the, the following sort of, uh, yeah, basically month. But, uh, but let, let's, uh, is anyone having any, any sort of uh, question here or idea uh, for making this better? I know it's hard. Uh, we just throw you on, uh, and we have been. We think about this day and night. So uh, we we appreciate it's. Uh, it's not easy for after only a webinar. But you, you can always. We, we are very interested in your idea. So you can always say uh, you know get in contact with us. We're very appreciated of that. And and we do see even our investment forum. I have to compliment them. You know, there's a couple of investment forum for uh, Crunchfish as we have a public company, and a lot of good ideas coming out of that. So thank you uh, the investment community for. Uh, you know, also thinking about Crunchfish and, uh, you know, your investment in us and uh, how, how that could be better. So I, I pick up a lot of a good, good thinking from what you say there. So let, let me go back to then the sharing my screen again. Um, and um, just looking at um, what's going to happen next. Um, as you know, we, we run these webinars on a cycle. Uh, every second one is digital cash. So di digital cash will be back again in two weeks. Uh, and as I said, we will do a little bit more of a deep down into CBDC. That's on the 4th of Feb. Uh, on the 18th of Feb, uh, we're gonna have an external presenter actually. It's gonna be uh, from Viki, our Singaporean partner who delivers this secure environment that we run on a mobile phone. They're gonna talk about their technology. They're gonna talk about how we collaborate of how we go to market in Southeast Asia where Viki has a sort of strong presence. That's on the 18th of February. But interleave with the digital cash, uh, we also have uh, either a Crunchfish webinar or a gesture interaction webinar. Uh, next one, we're coming to the first Crunchfish webinar. It's also going to be an external presenter. We're going to have uh, Alf Ripple, who do uh, commission analysis on Crunchfish. And he's going to talk about how does he, how is he able to do you know, evaluation of a company like Crunchfish. And he, he, he has models, discounted cash flow models, and, and he using a lot of risk factors back and forth. And um, it's quite complicated, but, but I, I've asked him, can you please try to explain it? So it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how we can try to come up with a value uh, estimate of, of Crunchfish, because as, as you know, it's, it's not easy. Uh, but but he, will, he will give you a good uh, in, insight to that. And then on the 11th of Feb, uh, we'll be we'll back on gesture again. We had that last week. Uh, we had a gesture interaction introduction. And now we're going to talk more from a product perspective uh, on XR Skeleton. Uh, so that's on the 11th of Feb. All these are available on crunchy.com.webinars. Uh, we always record it. This, this recording will be out in just a few uh uh, uh, yeah, we always manage to actually bring it out before 12 noon. So I uh, hopefully we, we have a, you know, a press release on this and uh, it's out on 12 noon. So you can always see it afterwards as well. So um, I think that's that. We, we still have five minutes before we said, we, we always have a breakfast at nine. So we have to finish uh, by nine. Uh, and I guess it's late lunch in India. Is that, it's 12.30 for you, EVJ, isn't it? Uh, it's 1.30. 1.30 p.m. Yeah, 1.30 now. Yeah. yeah, so have you had lunch, VJ, or are you going for lunch? About to. You're we about to. We go for to. lunch now. Yeah. Yeah, cool. 
How about you, Magnus? Are you <laughs> did you have an early breakfast or are you like us eating afterwards? No, early. Early. Well, that's good. <laughs> you were alert today. I saw that. So uh, that was probably the uh, the breakfast then. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank all the great questions. Uh, you are doing an amazing job helping us to uh, understand our technology better. Uh, and uh, I really am um, enjoying these webinars, uh, uh, the interaction we have with you. Um, so uh, please continue following us. Uh, new for this week, I don't know if you saw that, but we have also, I, I think it worked. Uh, I hope it worked. We have also live streamed it on LinkedIn as well. Uh, that, that was new for this week. Uh, so uh, anyone on LinkedIn uh, have see maybe seen it there as well. And we will continue also using LinkedIn. Uh, we, we also announced it on Facebook, but I, what we learned is that we could only actually live stream it on one platform and, and we choose LinkedIn. And I think we will continue having a LinkedIn um, broadcasting as well as then uh, uh, Zoom uh, broadcasting. But with that, uh, any final words, Magnus from Stockholm? Uh, no. Um... But is then, it snowing? Uh, it was snowing here in Malmö. Is it snowing in Stockholm? No, it, today it's just cold. Cold, yeah. yeah. And what is that? Uh, in uh, Indians don't know what cold in Stockholm is. Huh? <laughs> How cold is that? <laughs> it's it's cold here. Yeah. Uh, we have it's cold by our standards. It's Eleven degrees outside right now. Yeah, that's so, summer in Sweden. In Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have, yeah. Magnus? Is it uh, freezing? Yeah, yeah, it's warm. Five degrees zero, and but with wind, is it's much uh, cooler. Yeah, you, you should live in the south where we live. Yeah, uh, we have about sort of two degrees plus here. Magnus is sixty kilometers north from, uh, six hundred kilometers north from uh, Malmo, where they are our headquarters. But you've yeah, chosen yeah. it yourself, Magnus. Uh, so yeah, you know you can't complain. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. We'll we'll close, and uh, thank you so much for uh, attending. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.